Welcome everybody to the April 2023 version of the Atlanta Radio Club uh, monthly meeting. Um, of course, we've got another uh, outstanding program for you tonight. Uh, really looking forward to this one. Uh, real quick, uh, Stephen Slider and Jeff Hotsberg uh, made a trip to the Bank of America Tower last weekend, and I think they got, Stephen was supposed to send me an email, and I don't uh, see it, so I'm not 100% sure what all they did. I know they were trying to install a uh, maybe a new controller or something, and they ran into a little bit of a of a roadblock, and they've got to make another trip up to complete their work. But as far as I know, everything's working um, on all our repeaters. Uh, a couple, two or three weeks ago, uh, a trip was made to Stone Mountain, and they fixed the issue supposedly with uh, the D Star repeater, the, the the PBS repeater we support up there, and so that's supposedly functioning properly now. So across the board, we're supposedly up and running, and and we have no issues that I know of, at least at the moment. So if you have any, if you hear anything, uh, please do reach out to Stephen Slider, uh, KG4 PTO, and. Let him know if you hear something that doesn't sound right or or whatever it doesn't function properly so um, but as far as i know right now everything's functioning as it should be so uh, and always uh, thanks to them for staying on top of things repeater wise and uh, making our system function um, i'm going to go ahead and uh, we'll talk about a few events right after the meeting after the program but uh, i'll go ahead and turn the program over at this point to uh, our dashingly handsome program manager, Rob Bosatin, ki 4 uty With my, my new haircuts, my, my monthly meeting haircut. Um, good evening, everybody. This is uh, another good meeting. Another should be another good, good program. You know, our speaker tonight, it, it, you probably heard Patrick, Patrick Bolin, um, KJ7ZSU from, uh, from Geocron. And, uh, you know, normally we, we've been trying not to have programs that are ads, just pure ads for products, but for product for, for this, just like RT, you know, if the product is worth, worth it, or if it's a good product, there's nothing wrong with hearing about it from the manufacturer. I mean, it's, that's the best person to hear about it from if it's something of interest. And this looks like it's going to be fascinating. So let me, uh, before, without further ado, let me turn it over to our, uh, our speaker of the night, Patrick Bolin, over, over to you. Hey, everybody. Uh, we were talking about Bob's Red Mill. This is a pretty small group, so we'll just keep this kind of informal, but I have a lot of pictures and explanations that I can show you about. Thank you for keeping your, your uh, pictures on your, your, so I can see your profiles. A lot of times people just disappear, and then I kind of talk to myself. But um, I'm going to share my screen now. We, we chatted about Bob's Red Mill, so... This was uh, this is actually a week ago here in Portland. Do you see uh, three girls on the screen there? Yep. Awesome. Yep. So that's my wife on the, uh, the my left hand side, and then my two exchange students that live with me, and they're just in the room, right? They're just on the other side of this wall. Where are they uh, from? Uh, uh, Egypt and Uzbekistan. Oh wow! So yeah, but we're hanging out at Bob's Red Mill. This is and across the table are my my developers who are are meeting them. So, anyways. Love that kind of stuff. Patrick, uh, I speak Russian, so you're an Uzbek student uh, forced to speak Russian. So uh, if, <laughs> if you if you want to prove that you have intelligent friends, you can uh, bring her in. You know, uh, if after the meeting, uh, if you if you stick around, I'll go grab her and say, Katya, come here. Somebody wants to speak Russian to you because <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> I'm terrible at that. Uh, but their English is these are actually scholarship students. So they were. Uh, chosen by the State Department, and they're on a scholarship and a full ride for a year here in America. They are the best of their country. They're a, a incredible young women. We're so glad we did this. They're here for a year in my house. So anyway. Nice. Yeah. Uh, you want to hear about Geocron? Uh, why, why not? Okay. So I'm going to share my screen here, and uh, and we'll we'll talk about everything I know. So just a moment. All right, great. Uh, do you see a black screen that says Geocron in the middle? Yeah. Great. All right. So I'm sitting in a room that looks, uh, you see it in my background, but also on the picture. This is my 
Ham Shack in my studio. I've worked from home for the last 20 years, uh, sort of a self-employed guy. And, um, and so it's all set up just for me. And uh, I've got my three screens. I'm sitting here in this chair and, and my little microphone you see there. But that's where I'm coming to you from in a little community outside of Oregon, outside of Portland called Oregon City, about 25,000 people here. And i um, been living here for the last 20 years. So, but I do get out when I can. And last year I visited 41 states on a motorcycle visiting Geocron owners, which is way more fun than sitting in my office. <laughs> so here I am outside of ARL's headquarters, hanging out with Bob and, um, and they gave me a really welcome. So I ride an old, I ride a, a cop bike, which keeps traffic away from me. Love that. Just love riding. So a lot of traveling. Uh, to give you an example, uh, as of the end of as of November of last year, this is how many states I had traveled to see Geocron owners. And uh, talk to me about sport touring motorcycling, and we just go on and on. But like, here's an example of me at ARL and show, talking about the Geocron and uh, showing them. You can see there the Maidenhead grid and the propagation. So that's there at their ham shack, which is about the coolest ham shack I've ever seen. But I've seen many more. This is down actually in uh, Athens, Georgia. So uh, this is uh, some people I visited. And sometimes I wind up spending the night in their guest room and we have a beer and we talk to 11. And then in the morning, I'm off to another state and hang out with people. So a lot of times they'll get me on their they'll, uh, their Elmer network at 7 a.m. in the morning so they can chat it up. But it's such a great community. These are people who are often like kind of housebound or retired, but they have a huge community talking to people, other ham radio guys. Um, I really admire it. I didn't know about it until I got into Geocron, mm -hmm. that there was such a really great ham radio community out there. Uh, another one, this is uh, New Jersey, upstate New Jersey. So spent the night in their house, hanging out, huge ham shack, a whole room just for that. Uh, retired engineer over at Martin Thicol and, uh, and a retired teacher, uh, it was his wife. And this is a guy who knows everything about weather. He gets up at 5 a.m. in the morning and spends an hour and a half making logs for NOAA as a as a weather observer. And then he goes to work full time as a civil engineer. This is uh, just across the street from Athens, Georgia, over in the, in the over where they have the uh, South Carolina big, big golf tournament. Can't remember. But um, <laughs> anyway, cool place. And then uh, I get to see Geocron digital installations that are more commercial in nature because I know where everybody lives and I know where I've sold all these Geocrons. And so we go and I go and visit the coolest ones. This one is up in Pennsylvania at an audiovisual manufacturer. Uh, but the clock, the digital clock comes from a long history from 1964 of a mechanical clock that we still make uh, here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and so you can see here, it, it shares the same... Mercator projection and those sunshades on either side. Uh, but this clock is all mechanical, made by a guy who was way smarter than me, James Kilberg. And the inside of the clock uses LED lights now that shine through different diffusion panels, which creates that uh, creates that that insulation pattern or the, the gray line that's on the earth that you see in the clock. They cost about two to $4,000 uh, because the parts are increasingly expensive. Most of them are custom. There's 300 parts inside the clock and we make them here in this little building uh, outside uh, Portland. So in the back of that building, it looks like this and it exists right now. And so at four, at four they, they work till four o'clock and then we're done. And so right now that place exists and it's loaded up with clocks, except the lights are out, but at 7.30 a.m. tomorrow morning, they'll turn the lights on and they'll continue to restore geocrons and make new ones, maybe about one new one a week. But we'd work with about 300 geocron mechanical clocks per year. Most of them are restorations, people have, who have had them for like 20 years or they were handed down. I was like, my dad had this in his office and now I've got it and it's broken. What do you do? And we're the only shop in the world that'll work on them. And there's a lot to work on, all sorts of little gears, moving parts. All that sheet metal is not at Home Depot or Lowe's. It's all put together with, uh, it's all custom. So that's why they're expensive. And we've, I've, I've made some additions to the clock, uh, little engineering, stepper motors, like the kind that you see in clocks or that you see in printers. We moved away from the AC synchrotrons and do all that. And over the time, Jews Cron has been featured in a lot of different movies. So like these. 
with cool pictures like James Earl Jones. Like that one. That's in my office. James Kilberg was the guy who invented it. And uh, it's been lots of different not not notorious people have been photographed with him and the, the Geochron. This is, of course, Reagan. And then James Kilberg passed it on to the little kid there that's standing there with blonde hair. His name was Bob Kilberg. And Bob Kilberg, and then it passed to me about 10 years ago. So although the mechanical clock is not as hot as it used to be, that's for sure, because it's expensive, um, I'm really proud to have the shop. It's still open. It's been a labor of love at this point. Um, Geochron Digital pays the bills, and it keeps the mechanical shop open. Here's Gerald Ford. And President Obama, and you can see uh, a Geochron behind him. And uh, Biden, and you can see a Geochron behind him there in a FEMA boardroom. But the most beautiful ones are usually in guys' offices. This is an attorney down in Texas. And right across the way from, the, uh, from this Geochron, he installed another Geochron, and it's the digital Geochron. This is the same office. I think that is the coolest picture I've ever seen. I love those twofer pictures where you get a historical and a mechanical clock put together. That looks really great. So. Uh, just a moment. Anyway, so that's a quick review of the history of Geochron. It came to me about 10 years ago, and then I uh, invented the Geochron Digital. So I would go to trade shows, and then I'd take it and lug this 40-pound clock with me, and then people would look at it, and they'd say, oh, that's great. Oh, is it digital? And I'm like, no, no, it's not digital. It's it's mechanical. Don't you feel the the mechanical charisma of the clock. And they're like, yeah, yeah, it looks, looks really great. How much does it cost? Two to $4,000, they'd say. And I'd be like, and then they're like, oh, okay. And then they would walk on. And then like everybody who was older than me totally loved it. And everybody who was younger than me said, well, uh, how come it's not digital? <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, not digital. We're, we're purists around here. And then really I got to the point where I opened up the checking account to pay the bills and there was not enough money in the checking account to pay the bills. And I thought, dude, I gotta, I need to come up with another plan. <laughs> so uh, I, hence I, so what happened uh, just between, between us is I went to, um, there was a video that came up on my YouTube feed at night. Cause I sit there and I watch YouTube and the guy, there was a guy who had made a Geochron out of a Raspberry Pi. It was in like 680 resolution and it was gross looking, but he had the right idea. His name was Tim. And so I like tracked him down through YouTube and I finally found him and he was a professor in upstate New York. And I called him on his faculty phone and I said, hey, uh, this is Patrick, the owner of Geochron. I saw your video where you made a Geochron in like a little picture frame. You're not in trouble. I just want to talk to you about how you did that. And, uh, and he was like, Oh, well, I did this and this and this. And then we worked together for six months and that became Geochron 4K version 1.1, which was four different hardware platforms ago. But, uh, and and so anyways, we've continued to build on that uh, platform with, with better hardware, faster hardware, brought it to 4K and a bunch of stuff that I'm going to tell you about right now. Does anybody have any questions before I get into the digital thing? Yeah, Scott. And unmute myself. So Patrick, uh, so um, I, I'm sorry I was late to the party here and I was having some of my usual Apple technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so you're not a ham? I became a ham. You became a ham. So yeah. uh, the thing that I like about the Geochron the most is showing what we call the gray line or the Terminator. And um, I thought you might talk at some point about how Geochron shows the gray line. Is it a specific line or is it gray on either side of the line, et cetera? Okay. That's a, yeah. a huge yeah. question. I don't know. Uh, I could probably just uh, chat about that right now. Let me uh, let me pick my background and then you can, so we can see that gray line you're talking about. Here it is. Um, so the gray line is shown into a Mercator projection on the map, but the Mercator projection on a Geochron 
in the mechanical clock and now the digital clock is skewed northward. So we do have in the ham radio bundle, like an Aurora projection and an Aurora forecast that we get from NOAA, but you're not going to see a live Aurora line come down unless it's really far down onto the, onto the, into the, the Northern hemisphere. Um, so as you know, as hams, the earth is at a 23 degree axial tilt against the 23.4 degree axial tilt against the sun. And so, but it stays in the same plane as it moves around the sun. So that means this creates the seasons because when it's on this side, the Northern hemisphere gets more sunlight. And on the Southern hemisphere, the I'm sorry, on this side, the Southern hemisphere gets more sunlight. So this creates heat patterns on the earth, which create the hurricanes that you guys often get wrapped up to in your area of the world. And for us, it creates, well, it's still raining here in Portland, but pretty soon in a week or two, it's gonna clear up and everyone's gonna feel better. So. That's basically, so what the ham radio, for the, in the ham radio crowd, the gray line on the geochron has been super popular. If you wanted to know a visual representation of where the gray line was in 1964 through 1996, um, you'd either have to have a logbook or you'd have to have a magnificent mechanical geochron clock hanging in your ham shack. And so this is why half of my customers our geochron, our our, our our ham radio guys, because they they know the gray line and they know that the geochron was supplying that gray line to them in their in their ham shack. Then the internet came along, and you can get that about anywhere. But before it was only around on the geochron. So that's that's a that's a that's two minutes about what I know about the the gray line <laughs> and geochron. Yeah, that does that answer your question, Scott. Yeah, a little bit. I um, it's you know it's critical for long distance communication. You know, if I'm on the gray line and someone else on the gray line, we can usually talk with uh, low power and over long distances. And uh, and it's 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 fascinating. Uh -oh. I could be in uh -oh. a cave uh -oh. underground and uh, know when the sun was coming up or the sun going down just by the change in propagation on on different bands. So anyway, uh, shut yeah. up. There you go. I hear my buddy Bob NZ2Z is in there now. That's right. All right. All right. I'll keep, uh, I'll keep, I'll keep going unless there are any other questions. Super. Just a moment. All right. You should see a screen that says Geochron Digital 4K on it. You got that? Can you all see that? Give me a thumbs up. Thank you, Scott. Yes. yes. Okay. <clears throat> so Geochron Digital 4K, um, we took that that Mercator projection, and then we put it into basically a laptop that's a fanless laptop, and it's about the size of my hand. Uh, and then it plugs into an HDMI port of a TV that you provide. Hopefully it's a 4K TV or it's not gonna look as good. But, uh, and then people have put this into custom installations all over the world. But because it's digital, we can put a ton more stuff on it. I'll talk about that. If I said that, uh, if you've seen the movie Toy Story, you know, you've got Woody and you've got Buzz Lightyear. Geochron Digital is definitely Buzz Lightyear. Yes, it's cheaper and it's plastic, but it is all that. He and he and Geochron Digital thinks that it's all that too. Um, and it and so we brought it out of its infancy and it's probably just out of its teenage years and really beginning to feel the power of the digital, the digital world that is available through multiple API servers. All over the world so we're bringing in aviation weather satellites propagation and i'll explain some of that right now uh here's another example of what that looks like but not in a ham context just people put it in their front rooms because they want to talk about it so here's an example of how that looks here in this i see satellites i see the purple is where it's actively precipitating on earth if you look to where you are, you can see that there is earth lights at night as the gray line is coming across to Nevada into where I live and where I'm at right now, Oregon. Uh, you can see dots of white that are in the, in, the, in the North Pacific and that is clouds. And these are all in real time, as well as a swarm of ham radio satellites that are drifting around in the atmosphere. So this is an example of what that looks like. But we've also added other stuff like aviation. You can check out uh, where where uh, United Airlines is or UPS or Lufthansa or Egypt Air or any one of them. You can take the selection. 
And when we finish with zooming, I'll be able to bring in individual flights that you can track across the continent, which a lot of people have been asking for. Cool thing is uh, this is part one of the premium layers, uh, which is live earthquakes. So within five minutes or so of an earthquake occurring on Earth, it'll show up on the Geochron and its magnitude and location. And so usually uh, in in foreign countries, they're they're only reporting earthquakes that are over five uh, five on the Richter scale. But in the United States, our network is much better. So you see a lot of small um you see a lot of small ones. So like some of, some of them are volcanic, like that are up in the, uh, in Alaska. Uh, some of them are on a fault line, like you see up and down the West coast, uh, by San Francisco and Los Angeles, but some of them are in the middle of the United States. Can anybody tell me, go ahead and mute yourself. If you know, unmute yourself. Can anybody see that 3.74? So that's not volcanic and it's not, uh, it's seismic. New, new Madrid or new Madrid fault uh no so the the ones that are occurring in the midwestern united states usually don't come from a fault they're caused by something else oil drilling right fracking fracking so it's actually causing earthquakes and you see these more and more often uh on the geochron and on our uh remote sensing network super interesting stuff wow yeah yeah we're we're actually cracking the earth's mantle to get to fill up our tanks <laughs> now Believe me, I've got cars too, and I got to turn on the lights. But it's just interesting to see it on the Geochron. Um, we also added a, a pollution layer for people who are sensitive about that. You can see great clouds of fine particulate dust and all sorts of stuff that's drifting across the United States in carbon monoxide and um, seven different parameters of things that are tracked around the around the uh, around the world. And then the green dots you see are the reading of that particular selection, whatever you have, like this is PM 2.5 uh, in the city. And what you discover is that Southeast Asia, where everybody lives, uh, is very polluted. It's, it's, and, and, then, and then it drifts across the ocean into the United States. Uh, and this, is, this causes high pollution levels here, although not as high as what they're living with in, uh, in Southeast Asia. So put this all together, and I'm going to play this, and it turns into something really busy on a map. So this is in this is not in real time. This is sped up a little bit, but I'm just looking at ham radio satellites and their app and their uh, footprints. I see all sorts of uh, um, aviation that's drifting through. I see uh, solar patterns. This includes some of the ham radio bundle and call signs and all that kind of stuff. So I'll talk a little bit more about that now. Just a minute. Here we are. Nope, nope. And coming back. There we go. So one of the things that we added just recently, late last year, was the International Space Station's live view of Earth. So you're looking at a map of what, of what the world thinks it looks like. But what does the world actually look like? It looks like, it looks like this. So this is an example of, whoops, back, back. This is an example of um, the International Space Station live Earth view. So it's actually a picture-in-picture -picture window that shows up on the Geochron and shows you the world in real time with about a 30-second lag because it's coming from space um, on this camera that's mounted on the International Space Station. It is exciting to watch because everything else is just virtual, but that that's real. And that's one of my favorite layers that are on the Geochron. Um, and so it gets the attraction of people who have been to space. So like you see here, Scott Kelly, who is America's most famous astronaut. Uh, there he is with the Geochron behind him in his home office in Colorado Springs. Somebody sent me a picture of that. Love to get pictures. It's like 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 pictures of my baby. Look at that. Where do you get the feed from, from the uh, space station? Is that a live feed that you're pulling in? Sure. Well, yeah. uh, that's a complicated Never. question. But they, because they just changed their providers and threw us through our network off. Uh, so before it came through, NOAA was sending it to IBM. And then two weeks ago or three weeks ago, they changed providers. They went over to Google, which broke our network. And so the, the International Space Station Live Earth view was offline. And so now it's being delivered to our servers via Google. And then we propagate it to uh, all the geochrons that want to see the Live Earth view. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you you mentioned uh, 
adding features. Um, are those features added to ex the existing geocrons or does that require uh, purchasing newer equipment? Um, so yeah, I'll answer, I'll, I'll uh, let me talk about that real quick. The answer is it depends. <laughs> it depends. So if you get it, so one is the hardware platform, it's there's the Atlas. Oh. right here so this is like the atlas this is the this is like the computer that hooks into your tv and then we deliver that information via this little wi-fi or by an ethernet jack as you see here there how about there there it is and so um it comes with a bunch of basic features like aviation weather satellites all that stuff the gray line of course and multiple map sets uh, and so these are these are all standard for as long as a geocron is turned on and can get to the internet, we're going to be delivering all that free information to the geocron. There's also a premium section. And, and so this is stuff like uh, ham radio bundle, the ISS live earth feed earthquakes. And these are a couple bucks a month. And this is how we pay the bills. Uh, and so the one popular, the popular one is the ham radio bundle for ham radio guys. And so I'm going to get into that in just a minute. Does that, I didn't mean, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that later, but does that kind of answer your question? Yes, thanks. Okay, yeah, great. All right, let me get, get back to my screen here. Hold on. Oh, right. Well, this is cool. So this is a view of the, this is the International Space Station Live Earth view going over <laughs> Mexico. Just love that stuff. No, oh. is that the mega version right there? Uh, hold on, just a second. Let me turn this off. Okay, what was that? <laughs> uh, you you have in the new layer. You have mega mega view. I guess that's yeah. the mega. So a lot of people said it's just not big enough. So uh, last week we rolled out a new layer uh, that included a mega view, which takes up about a quarter of the 4K screen. It's as big as we can get it because the resolution to us is in 1080 and 4K is twice that. So uh, that's the mega view. Uh, the view that you see here, um, let me back up a couple, back, 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 back. Uh, it's now you can, you, there's four different selections on size. That was the largest and now you can get it twice that, you know, like maybe three times that size. And you can also put it at the top of the geocron, or you can put it down into the lower left-hand corner because a lot of people said, it's in the wrong spot. I want to put it elsewhere on the screen. So we, we developed that too. It's uh, exciting to watch because you could see where the ISS is. And then you'd be like, you could, you could look down and look at the, where the shadow of the ISS is on earth. And that's where it's showing right then. Beautiful cloud formations, and then sometimes it goes over cities that you can you think are so big, but you could barely see them because you know you're 300 miles up in space, and really right. we're just little tiny creatures living on a giant globe. Just love that stuff. All right. What I didn't realize is that uh, the NOAA satellites um, are not. I always thought they were fixed over locations, but they move around a lot, and they're it's interesting because they're not always you know, uh, very freshly over your area. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. They're moving at six miles a second. And I think there are 12 active satellites. But interesting, I learned this when we had big fires uh, here in the Pacific Northwest and everybody was waiting to find out what the satellite heat signatures were saying because some of those satellites did, uh, well, this, we, they couldn't tell where the fires were at exactly because they were a long ways away from civilization and it was dark and cloudy, but a satellite could look down with infrared and figure that out. But we would only get readings every 12 hours as to where the fire was at in these deep forested parts of Oregon and Northern California because only one satellite from NOAA was capable of making those readings. And so it would pass over the earth and pass with, and finally it would get back to Northern California, Oregon. Mm. So at six miles a second, it's about every 12 hours. Any one of those satellites is gonna pass over you. Mm. Yeah. Oh, did I, I didn't do that. Mike, you're loading a, uh, a whiteboard here. Are you talking to me, Mike? Yeah, Mike, you're punching you're punching buttons on your phone, brother. 
<laughs> I'm trying to find out where I'm at. <laughs> Sorry. Of course. How do I get out? There you go. There we go. It disappeared. Good job. All right. No. So let's let's do a little bit of uh, ham radio talking. Um, back to my screen. Great. So what we've done is, like I mentioned, half of my customers are ham radio guys. So I a couple of years ago, I got my ham radio license and started going to trade shows, KJ7ZSU. And um, we have a photo contest that we run at the end of every year. And we get magnificent photos of ham shacks and lots of other things. Uh, and then the, peop the people who win it, I send them like a free atlas. It's the gift. It's the prize. So here's an example of... Vieco 4 SBS, and he's up in Canada, Al Alberta, I think this guy's at. Great photo. His son stood on a ladder and took that picture. <laughs> I learned later. Um, here's another example of how the Geochron integrates into a ham shack. And this guy isn't, a, he's a ham, but he's also a big weather nerd. This is over in uh, Pennsylvania. No. <laughs> Beautiful. Sometimes I'll build cabinetry around it. So what we did was we we had these Mercator projection maps and we turned it into a ham map. And so we put in the different ITU zones and then we started to build on top of that. And so first of all, people want to know where they've been. And so here's an example of um, their, of their transmission history uh, using QRZ, which automatically syncs. And then sometimes we can get a real busy screen. You can choose to see the call, the call signs that you have actually talked to. Those will project onto the... Uh, onto the Geochron as well. If you've been really busy, like this guy here in Omaha. And you can also see DX propagation. And this is in real time. So here's an example of the gray line that's coming across Poland and into Algeria. And just before that band between Europe and uh, between the transmissions between Europe and America start to wake up uh, because the gray line is beneficial at that point. But uh, in every maidenhead grid, we can put up to eight and then up to 10 uh, call signs. And sometimes you're like, hey, you know, I'm transmitting and I'm using QRZ or I'm using FT8, but I'm not seeing my particular, um, I'm not seeing my thing come up. And that's because we get such a torrent of information coming at us through uh, that we can only display about 10% of it at the time. But what we're trying to do with this is give you an example of what it looks like and what bands are open. And in FT8, in Whisper, in DX, in DX, and not only in just having the noon in the middle of the map, but also a geocentric projection, which was a specific thing that our ham guys requested. To help sort that out, we put a band at the bottom of the, of the map. And so uh, like it's color coded. So you can select for those bands. You can have show two or three or all of them, and you can see what's open across the world at the time that you're ready to do your work. Um, you can see what, what's working and where other people are getting. And this stuff is available in some places online, but nobody brings to get it together in a big 4K display with a bunch of other stuff like Geochron does. To give you an example of some of those filters uh, that you can use uh, to, to sort out your particular setup and what information is useful to you, here's an example of the menu that's within the Geochron. And you can turn these different options on and off. <clears throat> So here's what that looks like. And this is FT8, I think. Um, so like I said, in the evening, East Coast gets busy talking to Europe and we can see the, the greens, the pinks, the blues, the reds. And these are all represent different bands that are shown in a legend down at the bottom of the screen. Also in this picture is uh, earthquake. You can see at the time there was a big one over in Indonesia, the gray line coming across Nebraska. And that green is where it's actively precipitating on Earth. And those little white specks are where the cities are on the world. So it's a really great way to sort out where you sit in context to the entire planet, especially in context to where you are with the other ham radio people. Here's another example of what that looks like. Somebody is killing it in Seattle. Good grief. Somebody's really busy. That's probably FT8 because nobody does that many hits in, in 15 minutes. <laughs> hey, Patrick, maybe a really dumb question, but in yeah. the Mercator projection that you've got here up at the top, A, sure. B, C, D, E, F, G, 
and there's no J up there. Why are some letters skipped in that uh, progression across the top? Tapped? How about, I don't know. I've noticed <laughs> that it doesn't, it doesn't follow an alphabet, but as to why that is, it's an internationally, it's, it's the same on all the maps. It's internationally recognized. Why would they skip J? Um, you know, S is skipped and um, no S is there, but there's uh, something to Q or, yeah. I, I totally don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Does anybody else know? Hmm. I like how you give the option to, you know, reduce the size of that or make it bigger, you know, either way, whatever you choose. There's a lot of flexibility with the programming. It's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we added the slim time band about nine months ago, and it's just because people are constantly emailing me, telling me what I should be doing with the Geochron, and then I throw them into a folder, and then I, <laughs> I, I was, well, actually, if it's just us, I'll show you. Um, so I keep track of the, all the ones that I really want to do, and it, it's right here. Uh, so you can see right here, these are all the layers that I'm I'm asking for. <laughs> so I go to my developers and I say, can we do that? Can we do that? Can we do that? And sometimes they say, oh yeah, three days. Or they say, oh yeah, three years. And then we're like, mm, we're not going to do that one. <laughs> I've learned a lot about developing, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but usually with Zooming, which I mentioned before we started here, that one's coming. That is the most requested feature. So that's one that we're working on. Where, where do you see the future of all this going? I mean, do you think that um, eventually with broadband and high resolution um, computers and stuff that eventually we'll, we'll all we'll be able to just pay you for an app of this? Or how does that work? What do you think? You know, a lot of people mention apps. Um, the thing that makes the Geochron work is that it's in 4K and it's big. All of this information is available in different apps and different places that you can get on your phone. You know, just like I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, and I see the weather and stuff like that. Yeah. But it, the the grandeur, the thing that the secret sauce for Geochron is that it's on a huge 4K TV in 4K, and it's glittery and it's beautiful. So, where I would like to go with the clock is like, for example, here on my phone, I've got here. If I go to Oh, I go to some weather app. My favorite apps are weather apps. Um, and I'm looking at the Pacific Northwest. It's raining. Uh, so here we are. We're going across the screen and doing all this. And I'm just looking at the Pacific Northwest. And if I zoom out to the whole earth, it doesn't make any sense. It just gets globby and not useful to me. But I can get that level of resolution for the entire earth on a Geochron. And no one does that. Yeah. And I, that's what I want in my office because I'm a nerd. So uh, I, and I think Geochron can do that, but that's where I want to go. And when I get down to zooming in North America, then I can see fires and tornadoes and hurricanes. I can see emergency announcements. I can see weather alerts. I can see, I can see even get down to, in some areas I can get, what if I showed traffic, the whole interstate system for the North America? Like I could do that. It's all available. And so we just, it's just going to take some time to, to put it all together. But hey, uh, uh, Patrick, I just thought of a sales opportunity for you. Uh, the Home Depot Corporation's store support center, as they call their world headquarters, is not too far from my house here in Northwest hmm. Atlanta. And um, they have people that do nothing but do their um, shipping in Canada and the shipping in Western United States and whatnot. And those guys probably need real time, all of that data in one place on their wall, just for cool fact. Oh, yeah. So that, that gets into, um, if you were trying to, so it's pretty easy to get like airports and how busy they are and like, and to color code them, like they're green, like flights are going smoothly or red. That information is available through the FAA and is something that we could get on the Geochron. But when it gets down to like location tracking, package tracking and all that kind of stuff, that's a very expensive integration proposition. So we're stuck in this realm between a commercial and, and consumer product. Uh, we're sort of both on both sides, but we don't have the horsepower or financial backing to bring in those kinds of integrations that give people like 
that that the commercial tracking. Um, so we're we're sort of taking low hanging fruit because our products are still just like a couple of bucks a month instead of like five hundred dollars a month or ten thousand dollars a month, which Home Depot would be happy to pay. So this this speaks to a business problem. We could do that, uh, but I need a room full of developers to make that happen, and I don't and I can't afford that. I think that's probably the most honest answer I could give anybody. <laughs> that's I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> you, could probably, you, could, you could probably pretty easily add all Home Depot store locations with a pin or something, but oh yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that would do for you. Yeah, we're gonna uh, not too long. We're gonna get to the point, especially with zooming, because we can bring out a level of resolution that you can't get when the geocron when when North America is only the size of my face. Um, that where you can like put in latitude and longitude and into a CSV file and then import it into the Geocron. And then you could populate 80, 90, 100 locations on and say, well, there's all the Home Depot stores or yeah. all that stuff. We're always do, we're already doing something like that through QRZ um, for your ADA logs, but that's as far as we've gotten. Hmm. Yeah. Any other questions or am I moving too fast or getting bored? No, it's fascinating. Yeah. What okay. about the positions of boats? Oh, man, you are not the first person to ask about that. So there is only there are three sources for boat traffic in the in in the world. Marine traffic dot net would be one of them. And so without zooming, there are too many boats that are in transit to show on a geocron. Uh, so if you think about the boats and like in the in my background here, you can see aviation. That's just one airline, but with boats, it would be like ten thousand different little icons on the screen, which would crowd out the map. With zooming, that's possible because I'm I can get into a spot and say these are the boats. But whereas air traffic is all easily available through the FAA, boat traffic and transponder network is not, and that costs between five to ten thousand dollars a month to get that information. Yeah. And I have been on calls with the providers of this information. I'm like, can't you just give it to us, you know, for real cheap? Because my guys are cheap. Um, and they're like, you know, they're 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 set up for commercial use. So this comes back to the Home Depot question: like, how do I make this? Can I make this? Can I afford to make it a consumer product? Well, not when there's just we're a micro business. So I can't afford five thousand dollars a month, and then without having a like big customers that are willing to pay that kind of money to, that I just can't go that deep into it without having a customer base like that wants it. So yeah. You do have you do have boat and marine marine or uh, shipping lanes, right? We do. Yeah. That's yeah. easily available. That's a static overlay from data I think that's from 2017, but boat traffic still follows that same route. So it gives you an idea of what's going on out there. Yeah. But like, if you go to marine traffic.net, I want to see all those boats on a geocron. That's very expensive. Yeah. To get that info. Yeah. All right. So, uh, kind of move forward here a little bit. Uh, just a moment. Coming back to the map. All right. So if you are a ham radio bundle subscriber, it's uh automatic, uh, you can get, if you're, uh, if you keep your ADIF logs on QRZ, you can automatically load those up to the Geocron and then filter by band and time. And it's, it's cool to see. Um, we recently added, I mentioned center projection because uh, the United States is not always in the middle of the map. And some people want it to be if they're located in North America so they could see the gray line cruising past their position. And their position is always in the middle of the map. That's not something that the original mechanical Geocron did, but we've just added it about nine months ago in the ham radio bundle. It's also useful to see some of the options that are available in the ham radio bundle on this screenshot. Huh. So actually, man, but you can see onto the left, uh, I've got DX spotting turned on, I've got center projection turned on, and I've got AMSAT satellites. The AMSAT satellites are the pink icons that are up, oops, here we go, nope, sorry, there we are, uh, that are up above us. Um, Australia, and also below in uh, Africa, uh, off the Cape. So, yeah. Amsat yeah, I find that very helpful because you can, you can, you know, when you see one coming, 
you can program your radio to that frequency by looking it up and you know try to bounce off of it and talk to somebody in VHF across the country or whatever. It's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah, and we just at the same time we added um, footprints, and I'll have a screenshot of that here in a minute. So like FT8 spots. Here's here's an example of a footprint. Um, so the, the closer you are to the center of that oval, which is sometimes an egg and sometimes perfect because we're trying to represent a, a, a three-dimensional globe on a two-dimensional surface. So the, the circles, the footprints do change as they move up and down the map and quite quickly because they're moving at five miles a second. But here's an example of what that looks like. Nice. And so uh, every picture that I ever get of a ham shack has got someone's ham sign clearly displayed and so of course you could put it in whatever color and as big a fonts as you want directly on the geochron screen that's just like for vanity but it looks really cool <laughs> also solar weather conditions here at the left this just look familiar to you it's available on many websites so we got permission from paul to put it on the geochron and then also the position of the planets i have no one's ever to been able to explain to me why this is useful for ham radio guys, but I think it looks really cool. That is cool. It is cool. Yeah. And no one can explain to me what the green is for. I still oh, don't know what the green is. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. No one's been able to tell me. Does, does anybody know what the green stripes are for? Like the green orbit lines? They both mm -hmm. have semicircle and semicircular. Yeah. Who produces that? Uh, Paul Herman, you can see it. Uh, he's got his credits down there at the bottom. Paul oh, yeah. Herman. Yeah. Yeah. He's I don't a... understand because they're elliptical orbits and these, this is a, a circular diagram. So I don't understand. Yeah. If you look at, uh, the most outlying planet Pluto, uh, you can see that it's a little bit elliptical. So I think it's shown roughly, but this is just a small widget on the screen. It doesn't take up a whole screen. So the resolution is not very good. Yeah. It's still cool. Here's that Aurora forecast that you should recognize from NOAA. And that comes up also on the Geochron. And then we have a maximum usable frequency layer. So this is over transmissions of uh, 3,000 miles. And you can see here it's a heat map. So it really crowds out the screen and it because it, it obliterates everything with its colors. But inside the Geochron, there are lots of different gradient selections so that you can see as much or as little as you want. And this is sort of a topographical map that's been applied to the maximum kilohertz transmission that the ionosphere can handle before you bounce it off into space. Where do you get that from? Uh, I met the guy, actually, and I went to his house. I visited him. Uh, what's his name? Andrew, Andrew, Andrew. Ah, shoot. But he's a ham guy. He's a developer, and he just, like, has a supercomputer mind, and he came up with this amazing algorithm and then hosted it. Um, and and gave it and it gives it to us in real time. So we, yeah, but I actually got a picture of him. He's not a real talkative fellow, but good lord, is he smart? What's that sun track? Oh yeah, the analemma. Sure, I'll explain that real quick. Uh, let's see here. You can't see it on that one. Here's another example of that. Now, this shows a ton of stuff, but to speak specifically, if you look into Southeast China, you can see the little. Uh, the sun, which is on the analemma. So in the analemma, the, uh, when we are at the summer solstice, the sun is at the top of the figure eight. And when we come down to the bottom of the analemma, that's six months later, in winter solstice, it's at the bottom of the analemma. And so what maps are trying to communicate to you that the geochron does in real time is the relative position of the sun above the horizon at high noon. So if you took a picture of the sun every day uh, at high noon, and then you made it into a composite image, it would form that figure eight in the sky. But it wouldn't be a straight up and down figure eight like you see. It would be dependent on where you are in the world and the angle at which you are viewing the sun. But uh, as the, and this is an original feature of the geochrome mechanical clock. There's a little LED diode that is on a particular gear that just moves in that figure eight pattern up and down. If you're at the solstices where the gray line is parallel to itself, then the sun would be right on the uh, equator on a, on, a, on a projection map like this. And so 
super interesting. Most people don't know what that figure eight is for, but uh, it makes sense when you look at it on a geocron. I thought it was really cool during the recent solstice to see that it was right on the equator. That was pretty neat. Yeah, yeah, it'll always be on the on the equator. The um, on the mechanical clock, one of the problems that we have is that it's the position of the sun at 1988, and so uh, so the the solstices will vary by several days, plus or minus, just depending on what year it is, because of leap year and a bunch of stuff that I don't. It's above my pay grade to understand. But and so when people have a mechanical clock and they see it's straight up and down and it's, it's in the solstice, but it might be just off a little bit like the gray line, they're like, oh, my mechanical clock is broken. Nope, that's just because your solstices and your analemma is set to 1988 because that's when they made the last gear change. But we, but in the digital, it should be pretty dead on because it's the digital and we've we've made it so it's super accurate. Patrick, it may be because of what's called the progression where the earth tilts, the, the tilt on its axis wobbles slightly, yeah. and that slightly changes the solstices, I think. Uh, you're probably right. And that wobble is reflected in the analemma. The best way I've had it described to me is that if you look at that analemma, you see a, a, a figure eight, but what it really is, is it's a warped circle that's been turned onto its side because the earth does wobble in its orbit. I think that's cool. And that that's, um, you can position that on the map where you want that, you know, where you want the. So it's, uh, it's always um, in the center, but you can turn it off if you want to. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, so this is uh, this map that you're looking at. You're seeing the maximum usable frequency, seeing the planets, solar weather the, down in the lower left hand corner there's local time uh you could that the yellow would be the local well the the yellow would be you could set your local time and and utc simultaneously uh this one's set up in the same time zone but like pdt where i am uh that would be off by some hours and then the, the date is on the right hand side you see the propagation that's been that's moving that's color coded and the legend down is down at the bottom the day of the week band is below the geochron symbol, the Thursday and the Wednesday. This is also a knockoff of the uh, a copy from the mechanical clock. Um, and then the, the extended time band that you see at the top. So this is, and then you also see the weather and the clouds and spinning. And I don't think we have any satellites on this one, but there are really too many options on a geochron to show them all simultaneously. It just gets too busy. One thing that I've added that is an important component to us as a business is that there are thousands and thousands of geochrons that are out there. And so just recently, we upgraded our servers and did a bunch of development work to reflect like we were just, it was just the servers were being, the geochrons touch uh, the server every 30 seconds to get new and live information. And they, and our server was constantly crashing and then rebooting itself. And so like, 70% of our requests are being from the geochrons are being answered. But just in the last three months, we've uh, updated our servers with real stuff. And it looks like this. And when I see 99.96% up in the corner, that means that of all the requests that are out there from geochron, 99.6% of them are being answered and replied to, which makes me a happy, a happy project manager knowing that the system is working well. So <laughs> behind behind the curtain, there's a whole network of years of programming that makes that possible. Uh, so I think, let me, this is the video. Here's another video of the whole thing spinning together. So there's my AMSAT satellite. Uh, there's the International Space Station on the yellow line spinning about. They call signs and propagation on top of a ham radio map. And it looks pretty crummy here on my screen, but when it's in real time on a 4K screen, it looks really cool. Patrick, just out of curiosity, uh, what percentage of your sales are for the Atlas are um, North America versus other parts of the world? Oh, that is a great question. Um, so the answer is probably three quarters are North America. Okay. Uh, and then... Another 10 per no, maybe I could have 80% is North America. Uh 15% would be Europe, and another 5% would be elsewhere. Yeah. So you just uh, need to do a little global marketing. 
Oh, no. who can afford that? Yeah. Uh, so we spend a little bit of money on on targeted ads that are online, but not much. Mostly it's word of mouth. Uh, people see it in somebody's shack or somebody saw it someplace. And then people are like, where'd that come from? Because if you see it on, we don't, we don't have the money to do magazine ads or to really get involved with like YouTube action or that kind of stuff. And so we have a dealer network, of course, ham radio outlet, um, DX engineering, uh, uh, KPM four and a couple and, and a few more that uh, that carry the geocron and they do their work at trade shows and i'll be at hamvention here in uh in about a month and a half and i'll just stand with gigaparts and stand they set up a geocron for me and i'll just chat it up with everybody and could people come find me they're like oh hey how come you haven't done this yet and so it's just like i'm the customer support line that's there for real <laughs> let me tell you i don't have to pay any research company i people ham radio guys are totally will tell me what they want to do with the geocron <laughs> anyway so at this point it's uh it's just mostly word of mouth and then the the newsletter is is a really great option too and i write those myself and um those are very responsive i, I spent a lot of time on those so in fact let me get through these photos so here's a another ham shack with a geocron this one won the contest, I think back in uh, 2021. And I love backlighting. I'm such a sucker for blue backlighting. Uh, this one is in Europe, actually. A lot of the pictures in Europe are in smaller rooms because Americans love their big, big shacks. But in Europe, they don't have as much room to work with. Look at all those radios. That's awesome. Yeah. It's like he had that, like, like a custom cabinet made for just his equipment because it all fits yeah. so perfectly. That looked great. Yeah. Uh, this is the uh, Amateur Radio Club at the Kennedy Space Center. <laughs> I love that one. Uh, yeah. And so anyways, talking about the newsletter, if you subscribe to the newsletter, then I'll automatically send you a coupon for 10% off uh, an Atlas. And you get a free premium layer as well if you buy it from our website. But we have plenty of really great uh, people who are out there selling it as well giga parts dx ham radio outlet and a couple others but um it is by this that the company exists and is is growing and i'm the guy who who steers the ship as best i can but um do it's a lot of work yeah yeah i want to answer more questions uh if you have any let's talk oh, it's a great product for sure uh, i've got a question about the I didn't realize that this started as a mechanical uh, device. Um, that sort of surprised me. So you still support the mechanical device. Do you still sell the mechanical version? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. They're expensive. And so people, um, so that that's a big story all by itself. Um, the mechanical shop, as as you know, there, there's a there's a labor crisis across the United States, and so there's not enough workers to do the work. Um, everybody's retiring, or they don't want to work, and so the mechanical shop has been a struggle to keep open. I can't find enough mature clock technicians to work on the mechanical clock, and so we do build new ones. And at about uh, maybe one one per week, we'll get a new order, but we handle in total about 300 mechanical clocks per year out of our shop in Portland. And however, um, we we're having a labor crunch. And so what that looks like to me is I'll show you. Would, would I be correct in assuming that the mechanical version doesn't have all the capabilities of the digital version? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. It's like Woody and Buzz Lightyear. So like Woody is like <laughs> almost simple cowboy <laughs> and that's the mechanical. That's I'm doing everything I used to do since 1964. But the the Geochron digital is uh, is the bomb. So that was that's the aid. When you see one of those mechanical ones, and I saw the first one, I don't know, thirty years ago, and I thought this is the coolest, sexiest thing. How do they make the gray line flexible and yeah. change in a mechanical clock? And I just stood there looking at the thing and thought, wow. <laughs> yeah. 
so, I'm, I'm amazed by it. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, uh, just, I'm going to show you a picture. Actually, you, you ask about the, the flexible bows that make that gray line happen in the mechanical clock. So people will order parts from us. And uh, here's a picture that I just took yesterday trying to explain this to somebody. And I'm going to share this on my screen. But uh, here's an example of what that looks like. All right. So here's one of those bows. Over here on the right-hand side, you can see the flexible bows that are sitting there, that there's a pair. Um, the day of the week band, uh, down here, the calendar band. And then these are the sunshades that flex. But it's those bows, which are little thin reeds that, that are torqued and flex inside the machine right according to where the gray line is at 24 7 365 days a year and they're pretty accurate and that is the kind of the genius that came from james kilberg that frankly we've 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 never improved on because it's it's a it's a legacy cool item and but we, we made the digital which is a lot easier to program but this kind of mechanical engineering is way over our heads yeah that's an astounding piece of work yeah yeah pretty cool uh, I have a question about pricing then for the for the Atlas and then your you said there are free layers that come with it and then you've got the the premium layers so maybe yeah. we can talk about the prices on those and how that breaks sure. down. All yeah. That. So um, the computer itself, this little this hardware platform, which is like a laptop without a screen, but it comes to use a remote for it, like this. Um, so the computer itself is four forty nine. That's retail, four hundred forty nine dollars. Uh, and then uh, it's like a quad core Intel computer. And then that comes with everything on Geochron and then the premium layers. So this would be like the earthquake layer is 20 bucks a year. Uh, the, the weather is included. Uh, aviation is included. Uh, Earth, like I mentioned earthquake already. The ham radio bundle is $69 per year uh, because it's so full. And so we have hundreds and hundreds of subscribers that, that use the ham radio bundle uh, for them in their shack. But you'll have to provide the 4K screen and you can get it as big as you want or as little as you want. Try not to get under 32 inches because then some of the details, even in 4K, are not going to come through. You need a little bit more size. Um, bigger the better. But here in our shop, here in my office, we use um, 42 inches. And a cheap 4K. I, I've never seen the difference between an expensive 4K machine, 4K screen, and a cheap one. So if you're looking to set that up, don't let the price of the 4K TV think that it's going to get any better if you spend more money on it. And like HRO sells the uh, the Atlas and the you get the premium subscriptions from them when you buy that, or you get it from you after you get it. Yeah. So the premium subscriptions are you when you buy it and then you get it up and then you can do a trial period of like a week for most of them and try it out and see if you like it. And if you do, then on the Atlas, it's going to give you a code and then you go to our website, give it the code, and then it will the website will sync the, the continuation of the premium layer with our servers. And then so it's just available through geochron.com. So DX engineering, we'll say the platform, the Geochron, the gray line, and all the map stuff and the free stuff, but you'll come to geochron.com to get the subscriptions. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. As much as they wish that wasn't true, that's <laughs> how it works. <laughs> like, get how do I get on that? No, nope, that's us. <laughs> the, uh, are they selling them pretty much for, is that like an MSRP, those prices, or are they... A Geochron runs on a minimum advertised price, so we don't allow people to, to to cut prices unless I always, for major ham shows, I'll cut the price, you know, for like hamcation or hamvention, we'll bring that down to $3.99. Uh, and, but I don't do any selling at those shows. I just let the dealers do all the selling at those shows. And then once in a while, we'll like have a promotion, you know, like, for example, the ongoing promotion is if you've subscribed to the newsletter, it's 10% off. So that puts I, it almost three ninety nine. Yeah, yeah, but through our website. Yeah, that's pretty nice. That's very nice. Mm -hmm. Yep. Patrick, also, thanks, thanks a ton. This was awesome. I've got a breakfast meeting in the morning, and you night owls 
and retirees can hang out here for hours. Yeah. That's us. If we could stay awake that long. <laughs> Scott, take care. Thanks. Great. Anybody else with any questions anywhere? Where you know, I always call on, on NZ two Z. He's he's got a you gotta have a, you always have a intelligent question about something there, Bob. If he's if he's sitting there. <laughs> uh, are there too many services you can load on it? Uh, like, well, you could certainly like crowd out the screen so that it's no longer usable. There's just a lot of, we're adding stuff all the time. Yeah. So, so you can run multiple premium layers at one time. You don't have to unload one to reinstall the other. Yeah. Yeah. Like for example, right now, uh, on the screen behind me, uh, I'm showing earthquakes. I'm showing weather, which is just a, a free layer. Uh, and, um, yes, but all the layers can be done at one time. There are a few exceptions. If you get too busy with the, with the, uh, with like propagation, then the computer is going to start lagging when you start putting on, like, if you put on a dozen layers simultaneously, it's going to start laggy because it's just like any computer, it's going to get overloaded, yep. but you'll know, um, it'll be like, Hey, 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 you want to do, you want to do the solar ham radio bundle weather aviation and the international space station video view all at the same time i'm going to have to work on that uh it, it, it might start to get laggy got it thank you mm -hmm. okay rob i'm awake <laughs> yeah, do you have any 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 questions i know you're i always... I, <clears throat> I used to teach <clears throat> graphic analysis of uh, ge geographical features and this thing really floats my boat. So I'm so happy with it. And I think what I also like is that you seem to be having a good time doing this. You seem to be having fun really doing this. And that excites me as well. So now I have to find space on my walls <laughs> and a 4K screen because this is a must have in any shack. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Uh, when I, I, I go to the mechanical shop and I didn't, I didn't make that baby, but I did make this baby and it's sort of, I, I love my children equally, but I would really like to spend more time on digital actually. Yeah. I love the maps. Yeah. Maps are cool. I, I got, I got map books all over my house. Yeah. Yeah. And if I'm building a, I'm building a, a, a composite map of uh, the Atlanta region on a wall in a hallway in the basement. Yeah. Wow. What I love about maps is that the, the places I've traveled to, like, and I, I see it on a map, I'm like India and I've been to India and it's one o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, I know what one o'clock in the morning feels like in wow. India in Madurai. And, and I can see that happening on a geocron and it, I don't know, just kind of takes me back there. And I really cherish those experiences and the map reawakens them for me. Yes. This has been fantastic. And hey, Bob, you need to put the uh, the Atlanta fault line on your on your map. <laughs> Make sure you, you can, it's just east of town, right between Atlanta and Stone Mountain. Mm -hmm. We may have a special event there. Anyone, <laughs> anyone? Bueller, Bueller. Um, I think, I think, I think we've been sated, Patrick. I think. Yeah. Well, thanks for letting me talk about my favorite thing. So you, you just subscribe to the newsletter, which is free, right? And then, and you get 10%. That's right. You'll get a coupon code simultaneously with that subscription to the newsletter. It's of course free newsletter and the 10% comes in a different email. Just make sure it doesn't go to your trash. Uh, and then you can use that to order it uh, on the website. But the 10% coupon does have a limit of, I think, two weeks. So, however, we're a small company. If you say, hey, I got the newsletter and it's been a month, can I get that coupon again? Then Noriel, who's my tech support email guy, he'll be like, oh, yeah, sure. So, it. And you get one free premium layer, you said, right? Is that ham radio layer? Whatever you like. No, oh, that, that would be covered. Cool. For the first year or for forever? One year. <laughs> okay. That's good enough.
Yep. Great. Yeah. All right, John. Thank, thank you, Patrick. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, uh, I congratulate myself because this was a great. <laughs> I had a good idea to have you, and you, yeah, and you, you got more questions than than, than we normally get. So good. That's a great time. Yeah, I like it uh, because everybody kept their screen on mostly, and I get to chat with people, and it was more of a conversation than just like you know a speaker presentation. Thanks. Yeah, our, one of our intimate Atlanta Radio Club meetings. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, the video will be available in a few days. I'll send you an email with the with the YouTube link for the video of the meeting. Uh, thank right. you, Patrick. This has been an, an amazing presentation. Yeah, thank you, and good luck to you, Patrick, going down the road. It, it's an awesome product. Thanks. All right, thanks. I'll keep working on it. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, all right. I'm about getting called for dinner downstairs with my girls, so I'm going to... We missed out. Scott took off, so we don't get to hear the Russian being spoken. <laughs> oh, yeah, the Russian. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, sh man, those girls are awesome. Yeah, my brother had two... two um children from from russia yeah you know like free trial for adoption and and then uh, uh oh, wow. went to buy. and yeah the, the language difference was killed killed my brother yeah yeah fortunately these girls have they're, they're fluent uh in not just english but in some of them like i katya is three different she's fluent in three languages like they're they're going to our local high school and they are the favorites of the teachers because they are 4.0 students they just it's easy for them because they come from really rigorous backgrounds. So if they're the favorite of the teachers, um, that means their fellow students probably don't like them. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That, that has happened. Um, anyway. Thanks again. Go, John, take it. All right. All right. Uh, thanks, thanks everybody. Patrick. I'm going to go down to dinner. Thank you very much. Enjoy your evening. Okay. Bye. Hey, Patrick. Appreciate it. All right, guys, just uh, just a reminder that uh, if you saw, we're not going to be doing our QSO event this weekend because of the weather, Saturday at Brook Run, and it's Easter weekend on top of it. Uh, so we're not doing the second Sunday session because of that, which is also this weekend that we're, we are doing uh, our normal testing session. So if anybody asks you where they can test, we're doing our normal noontime, I believe it is, testing session at uh, PDK on the second floor where they normally do it so yeah, we barely uh, found three ve's <laughs> yeah yeah it was a it's a tough weekend to do all this stuff on with the spring break and that's probably why we were so lightly attended tonight too i would imagine people are out doing other things this week so uh at the end of the month the 29th of april we're going to participate in the special event station for pancreatic cancer uh, there's a group up in pittsburgh that started this last year and they're trying to expand it and called me and I said oh what the heck we'll, we'll 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 give it a whirl and set up a station out there it's at that new uh, quarry park if you've ever seen uh, where they filled in the quarry out on the west side of town um, I went out there last week and it's a neat park I'm hoping that we're up on the top second if you've ever been to that park it's a quarry so part of it's on the upper end of the of the property and the rest of it's down a, a hill and the picture that's on the screen doesn't do it justice. It's not a bad hike, but it's a little bit of a hike to get down and back up. So I'm hoping it's up on the topper end behind where that ham for pan cam logo is, uh, is a flat area right level with the parking lot. I'm hoping that that's where they're setting all the vendors up and where we might be located. So, but thinking about joining us for that, um, we'll, uh, we'll have a radio or two set up and, uh, if, you know, come out get on the radio if not come out and hang out with us and and uh, socialize as we like to do and um it should yeah, be a great that. park huh it's a great park yeah it's, it's a, a great park yeah and uh if you're into cemeteries when i was out there last week and i real i've never been to it before but we went into westview cemetery which is a couple miles from there and that's a neat uh very historic it's like the largest uh, cemetery in the southeast and it's where the woodruffs and the candlers and all them are are buried and it's got a humongous ma mausoleum in the back that's been used in several movies but uh that's a neat thing too but come out to the park and join us on the 29th of uh, april we'll set up around uh, eight or so in the morning and i believe the walk starts around 10 and then we're going to try to go until about six in the afternoon uh and there'll be hams around the country that are participating in this under our region of course is n4p 
and uh, all the other regions are N whatever P and uh, they've got several of the regions that have got clubs that will be doing this. So um, it's kind of a cancer, a pancreatic cancer awareness event and, and you've got the hams for PanCam trying to um, provide an opportunity to kind of promote awareness across the bands too, so. John, question. Yes, uh, did I hear you say you don't know if the um, setup will be close to where we park our cars? I don't know yet. I'm trying to get, I'm I'm trying to get in touch with the person out there to let find out what, because this is the first year they've done it at this particular location. So I don't even have, I can't even go look and see where they've done it because it's not the same place. So uh, I, my 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 bet is since I was out there last weekend, my bet is it's up there where that logo is on the area that's right with the parking lot. Now there's not a, uh, there's not a ton of parking right there. So there's a church nearby, but I would assume that we might get some, maybe they'll, they'll leave the vendors to, to either that, or maybe they're doing it down below because there's a church property right beside it. And maybe they're going to do it down below and still will not be far from where we're set up and where we're parking I, I, one way or the other. It doesn't look like we're going to be too far uh from parking to setting up i just don't know yet i'll, I'll have information on that in the next couple of days so and then i'll be able to let everybody know so yeah well, i was looking to see if they say where they're gonna you know where they're gonna yeah there's not a whole lot on their their atlanta website um like i said it's this is the first year they've done it at this park so i'm kind of thinking it'll be probably with if everybody's they'll probably I would imagine people will ride together because the walkers are kind of doing this in teams and um, based on other events I've seen that they've done, I would assume I'm going to bring the white tent and we'll, we'll have the pop-up tent. And um, I just need to know where we're going to be because if we're out in the middle, there's no trees. So we'll have to do all vertical because there's nowhere to attach an antenna to. But if we're over on the side there, we might be at least reach a tree or two. So um i don't i just don't know yet so we'll, that's kind of a the information to be filled in as we go so that's about all i have for right now like i said i don't have any more information on the uh, repeaters at the moment so um we um i I'm, I'm tempted to try again to do a breakfast next weekend the 15th uh do any of y'all have an interest in showing up to breakfast uh We've been doing it at Gold. That would be the 15th. We've been doing it at Goldberg's, but I thought maybe this would go around. I might just do it at a Hardee's or something where we can get a cheap biscuit or something. Any of y'all have an interest in attending? Not at 7.30. <laughs> well, I mean, you can come at 8.30 if you want. Um, we've had a couple of people show up the last two times we've done it. But I, would, I thought it'd be a way to give people an opportunity that can't do lunches because of work to socialize. But it's a little slow go right now getting it going. Yeah, I know uh, Gars gets, yeah, they do theirs on Saturday, every every Saturday. Yeah, and they do theirs at 7.30. That's kind of one. I, it, I just, no, it's today, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. 7.38, it's a half hour. Yeah, and they're at... Uh, they moved to, the, they're at that five spot cafe that they like for everything. Else. Yeah. Yeah. I told Mark last time I said, he was like, well, I said, well, come at eight. I think I told Mike that too, a few times. Mike was asking about the time and he's a little too early for his get up, I guess. So. All right. Any other questions? No, we got lunch tomorrow and. Um, yeah. Hopefully Chick-fil-A will not run us out of there. But if they do, I guess we can always find another place. Call it a good run at Mellow Mushroom and find something else. Yeah, they don't seem to be, at least, I guess they're not mentioning it, you know, aggressively, you know, fighting for, for space in the parking lot. But I don't know. I mean, it's within walking distance of a lot of things. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what kind of, how it works out. I mean, in the in the beginning, I would imagine it'll be a little busy just because it's new and everybody wants to see it. So, but it may peter out traffic-wise pretty quickly. 
Yeah, and they're not open late at night, are they? So uh, that's where, like at night on set, Friday and Saturday night, that's when you know, Mushroom gets all the traffic. And yeah, I think the Chick fil A's usually close at nine or so. I'm not sure how late Mellow Mushroom's open. No, I'm sure they're open later than that on the weekends. Yeah, probably. They serve alcohol, so. Okay, I'm just looking at the map from, from the purple stride. Um, yeah, next, uh, well, I'll put a note out on this about our next speaker. We have the next speaker booked and I'll, I'll put something out next week about details on that. Oh, okay. All right. No. Hey, hey, Rob, did you ever post those uh, receiver, uh, that receiver information? Um, no. Uh, I, what I've been playing around with is is I made it, uh, I put it into um, um, HTML because I was going to post it on the, on the website in HTML so we can get it formatted a little, a little better. And I, I think I've almost got that, but yeah, I'll, I'll definitely post it. Ed, yeah, Ed did some research, did a lot of research and has come up with a, a nice chart of uh, all the Atlanta Metro uh, repeaters. Uh, you know, the two meter and the 440, the VHF, UHF repeaters and, you know, frequencies and, and offsets and PLs and what, what time the, uh, when their nets are for those clubs on those repeaters. So it's a it's a great little chart that I will I will get on the website uh, ASAP. Uh, once it gets on the website, is it something that will be easy for you to replace and update? Um, yeah, I need to do it in a way that in a way that will that will yeah because that's, the reason, a, that's an argument against doing the HTML. The reason that I um, say that is I keep finding more repeaters in North Georgia. And also, um, I'm finding that some of these nets away from Atlanta, you can get them on one repeater, but not the other. So I'm trying to check into these nets, see if they can hear me, if I can hear them. And then I'll update the spreadsheet as I get good repeaters that people can actually connect to. Yeah, the problem I had with, with, with our website was it would not display the the spreadsheet it would not display the data on on the page you know it would take the file and it would store the file and then it would give you a little link where you can download the file but what i was trying to do is display it on the page um that's why i was playing around converting it to html um but yeah no i i understand that it needs to be easy to change yeah, I'll, I'll update it as I can. I'll do that. What I did was I took uh, I took the spreadsheet and I just um, put it out in a uh, CSV file, and then I just wrote a program to take the CSV and generate all the HTML, you know, all the markup from it, and uh, that came out. That worked after trial and error. <laughs> so I think I got that. Good, good. All right, well, I guess that's that's it for, for me, John. Yep. All right. Uh, does uh, Mike have a hand up, or is that just him playing? Do you have a question, Mike? Maybe not. It did my magic and muted him again. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, um, hopefully we'll see you at lunch tomorrow, and... Uh, just stay tuned to the .io's group, Facebook, and the website for events that we're working on and, and participating in. And um, do, do come join us. It's a lot of fun, uh, especially when we have our outings, uh, get on the radio. And, or if nothing else, come out and hang out and meet other hands. We get, uh, we get a new person every once in a while that shows up with some of this stuff. So. Yeah, and Jerry will be there tomorrow, so we haven't seen him in a long time. Yeah, yeah. Yep. All right, well. Everybody enjoy the rest of your evening. And uh, like uh, Rob said, this uh, this presentation will be up uh, on video soon. So if you miss something, you can always go back and get a fill in. 
Yeah, I don't have to. I don't have to edit anything out, so it should be quick. <laughs> All righty. Well. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Everybody, have a good evening. Good night, everyone. All right.